Okay, so the first thing that I'd like to show is the Fangmine homepage. So this, uh, this page actually just uh, pretty much describes the project and it has some uh, different resources. So first of all, I wanna point out that we have documentation. So if you click here, you go to this read the docs page that has the documentation about using the Fangmine database itself. Then we also have an examples page. These, the examples showing here are actually the examples um, from a previous tutorial that is currently available on YouTube. And I will be updating this page with the current examples. I would I request that people do not try these examples during this tutorial because if we have too many people doing big searches, it will make the server slow. So I'd appreciate it. You just kind of ignore this for now. Um, we also have an announcements page, which will um, it will announce tutorials and then also new releases. But probably the most important part is that it, it provides information about these help sessions, which are given every two weeks. So the next help, help session um, will be a week from Wednesday, so a week from tomorrow, and then every two weeks after that. Um, and they're at 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. on Wednesdays every two weeks. Deb is the one who does the help sessions. And what she does is she, um, she just has Zoom running in the background. And so if anybody just wants to pop in at any time during the hour to ask questions, get her to explain something, you can, you know, she could explain something in general, show you how to do something, or if you have specific work that you're working on and need help with, she can help you with it. And so if you just register for a Zoom link with your preferred time, then that provides registrations for I mean, that provides the same link for all the future um, help sessions at that time. So you can attend any one or not attend any. Um, and then, so there's two different links for the 8 a.m. and the 4 p.m. Let's see what else. Okay, so um, I also wanna point out that in this new release of Fangmine, we actually have genome browsers for all of our um, Fangmine species, and we'll be looking at one of the genome browsers later. So um, I'm going to actually now enter the Fangmine database. You, you um, go to enter Fangmine, and then below that, there'll be either one or two releases showing. So what we do is that when we, when we first have a new release, we'll let the old release be be still available for about a month so that the users can have time to, to um, save their work and, and you know, try maybe both releases at the same time and see the difference in the new one before we take the old release away. But currently we, we just have the, the newest one. So I'm gonna click here to go to the Fangmine application. So the first thing I'd like to show you is how to create an account. So you can actually use Fangmine without creating an account, but an account allows you to save your work. And being able to save your work allows you to do the most powerful things because you get to save um, lists of genes and other kinds of things that have identifiers. And then you can use those lists in queries so that you can query for a whole list of things instead of just one at a time. So, so it's much more powerful if you create an account. So to do that, you just click login and then you would over here on the right side, there's um, a link for create account now. And all you have to do is enter your uh, username, which is the email address, and then just make up a password and click create account. Oops. And then, so for me, I already have an account, so I will log in. So the uh, first thing that I wanna show you here is our data source page. This lists all the sources of data in Fangmine, and it gives the specific releases and then sometimes the, the dates of the, um, of the releases. And then it also gives um, the publications to go with the data as well as the PubMed link so that you can cite whatever data you use. And then it also provides a, a link of you know, where we downloaded the data. And so we have um, the RefSeq gene where we sow ref sync genes is actually all the species that we have in fang mine. And you'll notice that we have a few extra that are not our domesticated animal species. And those are human, uh, mouse, and rat. And so those are there because uh, we have orthologs in fang mine. And if you do an ortholog search compared to human, 
then you can actually get more information for human orthologs and same with mouses and that because those species tend to have a lot more information than the domesticated animal species. But however, the, the entire genomes for these extra species are not loaded. It's really just the gene sets. So we have um, ensemble genes for most of the species, uh, except for water buffalo. We have orthologs from both ensemble Compara and OrthoDB. We have proteins and protein domains from Unipro and Interpro, interactions from BioGrid and Intact, um, several different ontologies. And these are mostly based on ontologies that the FANG con consortium uses. Um, we have gene ontology annotations, pathways from CAG and Reactome, um, publications in QTL from animal QTLDB. Um, you'll notice that not all of these have all the species listed. So there's a, this column that lists the species shows that some data sets are available only for a, a certain species. And so you can, if you always, if you wonder where we whether we have data for your species, just look it up here on the data source page. Um, we have SNP data from ensemble variation. Um, and then we have SNP array alias ID. So these are IDs, identifiers that come from SNP chips that might be different than the SNP, DB SNP RS IDs. Um, we have variant effects from ensemble variation. And new in this release is that we have gene expression levels that we have computed here at FangMind based on RNA-seq data that we downloaded from um, the NCBI SRA. So these, uh, these are data sets that are either gene expression atlas kinds of data sets or they're data sets generated by the FANG consortium. And these are all published in the, the publications are shown here. Our first set of FANG sequence annotation data is in this release. And this is the, um, these are histone marks for horse. And so we're in the process of, you know, of, of collecting additional FANG sequence annotation data for other species, and, and those will be loaded in, in the next release. We also have uh, new in this release is that we have um, gene disease associations for human from OMIM. And those, um, by having that there, if you search um, your species to find human orthologs, you can then also look for human disease associations for your orthologs. And then here we have a list of all the assemblies that are included. We'll go back to the home page. And so the first thing that I want to do is show you how to do the easiest, simplest kind of search. And that's just this using this quick search box, which so the other kind of search that we can do is uh, kind of the easier kind of search is to use what we call template queries. So in the middle of the home page, there's a bar that goes across that has tabs that show um, different kinds of queries that you can do um, kind of divided up just in, into categories according to what kind of data they have. So if you click on each one, you can see different queries. So we're gonna go to the FANG, the one for FANG. So both FANG and expression are new tabs in this release. And I wanna show you that um, sometimes you can't, we can't list all the queries available for this category here. So if you click on more queries, um, down below, it will eventually get to a page that has, could have additional queries. I'm not sure if that one is showing all of them already, but if you can't find a, a query that you want in one of those tabs, then just click more queries to see if there's one there. So the query that I wanna show you is this one that says organism to FANG analyses. And the reason why I wanna show this is because it's gonna give me the opportunity to explain some of the FANG metadata and some of the identifiers that go along with the FANG data that came from the FANG data portal. And it's really important to understand those in order to um, be able to link different kinds of data together and make sense. So first of all, I wanna point out, like I mentioned before on the data source page that currently we have FANG sequence annotation data only for horse. So even though we have a pull down menu that allows you to select a species, um, horse is the only one that will give you an output at this point. So all I have to do is click show results and um, it will give an output that shows, that provides a table that has the, the attributes that when we set up the query, we selected for output. So this, um, 
this table has a lot of information. It looks, it's kind of boring because it's really metadata, but these identifiers are actually really important for you to connect data sets together. So um, this, this particular set of data is actually um, a ChIP-seq data set. And these chips, this ChIP-seq was done to identify histone marks. So these are the, the different histone marks listed in this column. And when, um, when a, an analysis is done, um, the FANG data portal assigns an analysis accession. And so that's, how, that's our primary identifier for a FANG analysis. And what a FANG analysis actually means, it's not, a, it's not the sequencing a run or it's not the experiment that you would find when you, uh, for example, at the NCBI SRA, but it's, it's an accession for the actual work that was done to analyze that data. So it's the accession for the pipeline, the analyses that were done to identify the peaks and create the, the results file, which would be bed files. And so that's what an analysis accession is. And so to further um, explain that, I'm actually gonna right now go to the FANG um, data portal. And the reason why I wanna do that is because I want to explain the relationship between this anal analysis accession and then some of these other accessions that I have here particularly literally the biosample IDs. Because if you wanted to um, relate your work that you, the, the results you find with ChIP-seq to results in the RNA-seq, you actually have to connect that information using the biosample ID, which is what tells, you know, it's, it's which tissue was analyzed. And, and usually when people are looking at ChIP-seq, they actually like to look at the results um, in the context of, of the um, RNA-seq. Sorry about that. I just kind of highlighted something by mistake. Okay, so I'm gonna to go to the, the FANG data portal, which is a different website right now, just to show you that. This is where we, we got the data. So if, um, I'm on the, the analysis page, but just to show you how I got there, I, um, I selected, if, if you go to data, you can select analyses. And so that's how I got to this page. And then now I'll just um, click on horse to show all the horse analyses and then chip seek is what I'm interested in. And so what I, we're interested in the sequence annotation and in particular this data set, which is published. So the, the, we have this particular data set that I'm pointing to now. Um, this other one is not published yet. So let's just click on this so I can show you what the data is that we have. So if I click on an analysis accession, which is the same accession that we have in our database, it tells about um, this analysis. And, and then it actually, so it actually has an analysis protocol that shows all the methods. It has the bio project um, and it has the sample ID. And so the sample ID is actually really important for connecting your information to RNA-seq or also these experiments. So what these analyses do, what this group decided to do in their analysis is that they, they, um, they had done chip seek on two, um, basically two individuals, two, two individual animals. And then, um, and then when they did their final chip seek analysis, they, they actually um, combined results of two different experiments. And so that's why you have one analysis accession, but two experiment accessions and two run accessions. And so if you click on this sample here, um, it tells you that this is a virtual pool. So actually the, each one of those um, experiments had a different tissue sample. So there are actually two tissues involved, but then this virtual pool biosample ID was created to indicate that those two were merged. And so these are actually the two individual biosample IDs. So if we go back to um, FangMine and look at our results again, we can see that we have this biosample ID, which is a virtual sample pool, but we have this component sample ID, which is actually indicates the tissue. And so if I, um, let's see if I can get more information by mousing over. No, let me just click on it. So we can go to the page. It's a little bit slow for some reason. Go ahead. It's not gonna go, is it? Okay, come on, no. Just some reason clicking, there it is. 
you have to click hard, I guess. So this is just showing you that this is a component biosample ID. And this is the one that tells actually all the details about that tissue sample. So if you wanted to have more information like the age or you know, health status or things like that, you actually have to get the component biosamples. So let me just use the back page, um, back arrow that is. Um, I'm going to click on this query button to go back to my original query. So that I'm actually click, clicking up there and that query brought me back to this, um, the same uh, query template. But I'm gonna show you how I can edit this, um, this query using edit query. So if I click edit query, um, I get to this query builder. So the query builder is, is what we use to create all the queries. And basically it has a model browser on the left side, which, which shows uh, kind of a model of the data. And, and we, since this is an, a query about analyses, there's a, a set of data called analysis. And then these are attributes of analysis. Um, and then you have other data sets that are connected to it, for example, bio project and, and bio sample. And there's all, you know, you know, you can see that we actually have really a lot of metadata associated with this that we got from either the FANG data portal or um, the uh, this EBI sample database. Um, okay, so I would like to get some more information. I would like to, to know what software was used. So we look over on the right side, we'll see the query overview. And this shows um, all the columns in in us uh, in these light blue squares these are columns that are selected for output and then we have a couple constraints here so we are constraining that we want our project to make sure it's equal to fang and we want our organism to be equal to um, the horse and then if we go down further down we can see our these are the columns that that are output which are also shown up here but this actually shows the order of the columns so i would like to um software to know the software that was used. So I can click show here in software. And if you'll watch what's happening on the right side, you'll see show appear over here on the right. So if I, I mean software, sorry, appear on the right. So if I click show there. So now, now software has shown up over here. And if we go down, we can see that software was added onto the list of columns. So the columns are in the order according to how you added them to the query. So they're not in the order that we saw above that showed the query, they're, they're in order of how we added them. So I want that this to be in a different order so I can just move this box. I would like to show it up after after the peak width. So I can move it to over, actually sometimes it's hard to get it to move to the right place, let's see. I want it to be there. So that's gonna be, there's peak width and then it will be software. So now I can just click show results and there, um, let's see there's the analysis software. And so if we view the column sum summary, we can see that two kinds of software were used. Um, one of them was Max2. And so the Max2 is what they used to, to create the ones with narrow peaks. And then Sicer was used for one of the marks where they created both broad peaks and narrow peaks. So Sicer did the broad peaks. So I'm gonna show you a couple of other changes that you can do. Um, so one thing is that you can get rid of columns by clicking the X's. So I'm gonna just remove a few columns that we don't really need because they're pretty much all the same information just to make some more space. Let's see. Okay, so let's say um, I would like, I actually wanted to know some more about these component samples. So these are the tissues and what I want some more information about those. So I can click manage columns and I'm gonna actually make the font smaller here so that you can see everything. I'm gonna click add column. And here, um, here we see another kind of tree of the data. It's a little different format than the query builder, um, but sometimes it's a little bit easier to, to do, do it this way than using the query builder. So these shown in kind of this gray are the columns that are will already be output. And I'm gonna scroll down and I'm gonna look for the com component um, bio samples. So here it is, component sample IDs. And you can see that um, way down here, there's a bio sample ID for the component bio sample. So the things that I would like to add are animal age and developmental stage. So I, so I just highlight those, say add two columns, 
we'll just go ahead and make my font smaller there. And then apply changes. Then let me make it bigger again so you can see it. So there, um, here you can see that these, these two columns have, have been added. So you can see that there's you know, several different ways of adding more data to your table once, once you've done a search. So another thing you can do is you, um, I think I've already showed you, I don't know if I showed you the histogram, but I'll do it now. So you can um, say view column summary with this histogram and it actually tells you the numbers of counts of different things you have in that column. Um, so I, for, to relate to one of our uh, next examples, I'm gonna go ahead and click this subcutaneous abdominal adipose tissue. And I want to only save those. So I'm gonna say restrict table to matching rows after selecting that one. So there now um, I only have 10 rows and those are only the rows that have the adipose tissue. And so I could, if I wanted to undo that and have the whole table back, I could click the undo button, but I don't wanna do that right now. We can look at these. Um, so if you look at these, the biosample ID, there's probably only one for these virtual biosamples and they show up, um, they actually show up 10 times because of um, all the different experiments and component biosamples. If we look at the um, component biosamples, there are, there are two different ones, five each. And so there's actually five different analysis accessions for each of these biosamples. So I would like to save these biosample IDs for later because these biosample IDs are useful for doing uh, searching for gene expression because we can do a query that um, template query that allows us to identify all the genes that were expressed in that biosample. Um, and then uh, the next example that I'm going to show you is actually going to be something with these um, adipose samples. So if I just um, go to save as list, I can highlight component sample IDs, which is two biosamples, and click, and then say create list. Oops. And then create list, and then there I've created a list. And so I'm gonna actually click on lists. Um, when you click on lists, you can go, you, you end up either in one of two places, either in this upload page or in the view page, just depending on the last one you used. And so here's where I click on view. These are all, all the lists that I've saved. Um, if I go down to the bottom, um, there's these lists with a white background. These are lists that are available uh, to everyone by default. So they're all, they always show up. And these, these are just a list of all the genes and all the species. And we'll, um, the reason why we have these here is because when you do gene ontology enrichment, which I'll show you later, you might wanna use one of these as your background gene list for that kind of analysis. Um, the lists that have the, this colored background um, and say my, those are the, the um, lists that I've saved in my account, so only I can see them. And um, in the fact, you know, because I created an account and, do, and I'm doing this while logged in, that's what allows me to save these. And these will be saved after I log out, so they're permanently saved. And even when we have a new release, we actually transfer the user database to the new release so that your previous lists are saved. Um, so, so that's, um, that was an example focused on the FANG metadata. I'm actually now going to switch in it to an example where we're going to, um, we're actually going to look more of at the kind of more of the biological data. And then for this example, I'm really interested in looking to see um, if any significant GWAS SNPs found in horse are overlapping any histone marks or are they directly found within the marks? And so um, the first thing I wanna do is show you where I got the data for this example. And so the data for this example actually comes from animal QTLDB. And uh, we don't actually have horse QTL in FangMind because um, at animal QTLDB, they don't have the QTL mapped to genome coordinates. Um, rather they have the, all the data as senum organs. And so because of that, we can't load it directly into FangMind. However, we do have um, SNP for horse and we have the RS identifiers from DBSNP. And so, and those are the identifiers used in this file 
um, if you download this file that says all data by Santa Morgan. So here, here is the file that I downloaded and it has a lot of good information. So it has um, QTL symbols, trait names, and locate, you know, I'll have the chromosome, but not the actual coordinates. But then for the GWAS kinds of um, analyses, they will have the, um, the actual significant SNPs. And then for the classical QTL, it will have flanking markers. And then it's really nice about this is that there's also um, PubMed IDs for the publications that go with this. And so what I did to come up with an example is that I looked at, at several of these traits and I, I picked one that I thought came up with something interesting and I already have it highlighted here. So it's the osteochondrosis um, trait. So, so I have these, um, these SNPs that were significant GWAS SNPs and I'm going to um, paste those in to, into FangMine lists upload. So first I'm gonna select SNP. And then I'm going to select the course. And so it, these are unique identifiers, but so it's not absolutely necessary that you select the organism, but I think the query goes faster if you do select the organism, else it will be looking and searching all the organism data for the, those SNP IDs. So um, all I do is say create list. And then the first thing it does is it, it searches the database to see if those SNP are in the database. So it said that I entered 44 IDs and it found 43. Um, and it, there's one that wasn't found. And that's because um, we, we get our SNPs from Ensemble and Ensemble maps the SNPs to new assemblies whenever there's a new assembly. And apparently either this one didn't map to the assembly or maybe it was duplicated. And we don't, we don't have SNPs that are duplicated. They have to have only one location in order for them to be in FangMine. So the first thing to do is, is create a, a name for your list so that you can find it later and it makes sense to you. And then you click save as list. So right now it's not actually saved. So it's not really saved until you click save. This is just really a preview of what, what you're getting. So we click save as list and then um, you'll just get kind of like this, you know, a preliminary view of, of what you have. But, but this list is now saved. And if I went to my list of, um, of information, I could, or, or my list view, I'd be able to see that list there. So what I want to do is actually, I wanna do a region search, which I'm gonna show in a minute. And in order to do a region, region search, I need the coordinates, the chromosome location and the start and the end. And so um, I'm going to export a file and I want to change it to comma separated values. By default, it's tab separated. And I don't want all the columns. I want the SNP ID and then I just want the location, the, chromo the I chromosome ID start and end. So of course for a SNP, the start and end are the same location, the same spot, but our region search requires that you have both start and end coordinates. And so then you just click download file. Um, so I didn't change the name yet. It just says results.csv by default, but Intermine has a little glitch in it where if you change the name ahead of time, it, does, it are, always just changes back to results. So instead, just say save file. And then at that point, change it to um, just change, change the name of it. There, so now it's saved. So now we have the loca locations we need to do a region search. So I'm gonna click on regions here. And um, let me show you a little bit about this region search. So you always have to select your organism. And when you select an organism by default, the, uh, the assembly will actually change automatically to match, you know, to be the correct assembly for this organism. And that's because we only have one assembly per organism in Fang Lines. So, um, You'll notice that it, this is water buffalo. And so there's just a kind of a few different genome features that you can select that are available for, for finding with a region search. If we change it to Bas Taurus, you'll see that there are additional features and that's because the Bas Taurus genome is an older genome 
and it's just been analyzed for you know over many more years and so so more things have been identified in boss taurus than um, water buffalo but so in other words um, every species has a slightly different set of genome features that you can I identify um, so what you would do with one of these species is uh, basically you would just select one thing that you want to search and then enter coordinates and search it so however horse is is set up differently and so horse right now is the only one where we have these sequent tissue specific sequence annotations and so in order to have tissue specific information we had to create a new search menu and so if we wanted to see the um, original genome feature the the regular genome features we would open up this and click horse genome assembly and that that actually provides the usual thing but if we wanted to see um, histone modifications in any tissue so that you can pick um, any experiment um, which is also labeled by tissue peak width and in which mark you're looking at um, you would select one of these and so so what I've what we're going to do in this example is that we're going to select all of them and so when you, um, I can just click that and they're all selected so when when everything's selected there are the the genome features and we have now the term histone binding site and so I want to say something about histone binding site. So um, that is all of these terms are terms from the sequence ontology, which is official vocabulary for sequence features, which are, we are required to use. However, we couldn't find the very best term for histone modification mark. So what we're using is the term histone binding site, which is it's, it seems slightly not exactly correct, but that, that's the, the term that we're using when we we're talking about histone marks. So if I um, go back up here, I, I don't want, I only want to look for histone marks. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this one off. And so when I turn that one off, you can see then the only one left is histone binding site. So it doesn't matter if I turned it on or off. I just wanted to show you. So I'm going to check this and then I'm going to enter my coordinates. So I, I actually already have this spreadsheet open. So just to make things faster. So these are, this is the, um, the comma separated file basically just like the one we downloaded so the first column is the identifiers and the the next three are the um, location so normally you actually only need the location you don't need the ids in fact if you can enter an id into the search box it's gonna it won't work but i wanted to save these ids for later because i wanted i wanted to be able to go back and look at which snip ID is actually overlapping something. So this allow, would allow me to go back and look at those IDs corresponding to the locations. So I'm going to just copy the locations and paste into the search box. And, um, and I have the option of extending the regions at both sides, but I don't want to because I just want to find if the SNP is directly within inside these marks. And I'm going to click search. So the, um, the page size is just set to, to show 10 locations, but I think we had over you know, maybe around 30. So I'm going to change it so that everything shows up on one page. So this page shows um, results for each region. So they're kind of divided into little sections according to, to the regions that were entered, which you know, correspond exactly to our SNPs. So you have the choice of um, saving all of these uh, all of these matching histone marks by clicking go here. Um, and you can also um, save all of these results in a file, a tab delimited file. So what I normally like to do is just click here to save all my results and you know so that I have all this information for later, but then there's then there's other things I'll do. Um, I'm not going to do this now because I have I've already saved that. So I'll just click cancel. So I've already looked at these results and I uh, to find something inter interesting to show. So a lot of these have so many uh, overlap, so many things that they're just a, too much to look at right now. But what I'm interested in is actually um, this region here where this SNP overlap both an H3K for ME1 mark and an H3K 27AC mark. And so when these two marks overlap each other, it suggests an active enhancer. So I'm interested in this one. So I would like to just save these, the locations of these marks. And so by the way, if we've, we've ident 
uh, assigned identifier to every individual mark found in those um, ex experiments so that they can be, um, they, they have unique identifiers in our database so they can be searchable. So I'm going to save this list of just these two marks just by clicking go. And so you see now it goes back to what it looks like our list page. Um, this doesn't, um, when you save a list from a region search, it doesn't allow you to give it a new name, which might be annoying because it gives you sometimes a really weird looking name like this. So I can go to my my mine and which actually shows all of your lists in order of date created. So I'm gonna just do opposite order so that I can see the newest one, which is right here. And I can change the name of it. So I can say, um, stone, oops. Spell it. Okay, there. And so then now, um, so the order changed again. Now, if I go to this list page, my list view, I can, I'll see it up here. Now I'm gonna just click on it again, just to get back to it. So what I really wanted to do is actually save, I wanted to save these uh, coordinates so that I could use those in a region search because what I would like to do is find out what genes these histone marks are near. So if I click export again, and um, this time I'm gonna keep it as tab separated because you can also load a tab separated um, file directly into the region search. So I'll show you how to do it that way this time. And if you want to directly load a file into the region search, you can't have an identifier. So I'm gonna take everything away except for the chromosome ID start and the end, and then download that file, which I'm not actually gonna do because I already downloaded it. So I'll just cancel, but that's what you would do. So now it will go to the region search page and I will go back to horse. And this time I only wanna look at genome features and specifically genes. And this time I'm gonna just select a file. So my file is called um, Adibos Histone Mark Locations. I'm gonna just click open so it, now you can see it here. Um, and I want to extend my regions by 3 kb because sometimes you, you know, you're interested in nearby genes. So now I can uh, click search and then here, here are the results. It was really fast, just two regions. And of course these were near each other because they're overlapping. So one of them um, is, is close to two genes and the other one only one of those genes. So I can save a list of those genes and even though there are only two, you say, well, why bother saving a list? Well, because I want to use this list in a template query, there, having a list allows me to do both of them at the same time. So I can just click go. And rather than showing you how to change, how to change the name of the list, I'm gonna just leave it as this all regions gene list for. So just remember that for my next query. So I have this um, saved. We just click view, we can see it in our, we'll be able to see it in our list of lists. Or maybe oh, there it is, right here. So now I'm going to go to um, to the home page, and I actually want to look for gene expression of those genes. So I'll click expression, and I'll click the gene ID to gene expression template. And since I have um, I've saved a list with gene IDs in it, um, I can click constrain to be in. Of course, all of the other lists that have gene IDs also show up, so that could be a little bit. You know, annoying because it clutters things. But here it is, it's all regions gene list for. So, so any list that you save plus all the default lists show up in whenever you have a um, pull down menu with gene IDs. So I'll select that one. I'm gonna leave this as just anything with any FPKM, anything greater than zero, because I, I'm worried that um, this might, these genes might have low gene expression. So I don't wanna increase this number. I'm not going to select any of this other stuff here. These are all optional things that you could select, add to your um, query, but I don't want to. So I just click show results. And then here are the results. So there are 15 rows. If we just click on the histogram for a tissue, we can see, um, we can see all the tissues that these two genes are expressed in. Um, and then I want to click on this one, the adipose tissue, because that's actually the same tissue as, as the, um, oops, as the, uh, the ChIP-seq result. 
I'm going to say filter restrict table to matching rows. And you can see that actually only one of those genes has expression in adipose, very low expression. And um, you can see here it's listed twice because it's actually in, in two different of the tissue samples. So it was found in two different SRA experiments. So I'm going to show one other way of looking at these ChIP-seq results, and that is using the genome browser, because sometimes using a genome browser with ChIP-seq is a little bit, it could be helpful or, you know, can reveal things that you can't see just with do, looking at tables. So if you um, click on fangmine.org, you'll go back to the, the homepage, and I want to save my place, so I'm going to just make sure that I can open my link in a new tab. Oops. There, back to the home page. And then I'm going to click on JBrowse. First of all, I want to show you that about JBrowse has information just about using JBrowse, how to navigate, and how to select tracks, and then the track descriptions. But I'm not going to go in, into detail, detail on that now. I'm going to just show you some things. So here, um, I'm going to click the one for a horse. And, um, Here's the JBrowse page, which um, is blank right now. The first time you use JBrowse from, for any one organism, um, you'll likely get a blank page. Um, and then once you use it again, you'll, you'll probably see tracks that from a previous, you know, you saw previously, but, but it starts out as a blank page. So what I wanna do is that I want to navigate to our exact um, region of interest. Uh, we're actually pretty close because I was just here before, but let me show you how to get to the exact spot of where that SNP was. And so this is why um, I saved, I showed you how to save the results of the region search as a tab delimited file. And so this, this is the output. So this has the same information and it also has this column called user input. So these are all the regions that were entered. So, um, so it happens to be, let's see, these two rows here are the rows for those adipose results. So they're on chromosome 14. This col the very last column that's user input actually has the exact format that we need to enter in JBrowse. So it's really convenient if you just get to that column and then you can copy paste that into the JBrowse search box. So you just paste it into this box up here. And so it, it's the um, chromosome and coordinate. So it doesn't matter. This chromosome could be set to any chromosome. It doesn't really matter because by entering, having the chromosome ID listed in this search box that overrides whatever this one was set to. It just happens to be set to the same thing. But I'll click go. And so I actually had just entered one uh, one coordinate, which is one nucleotide. Of course, it has to show more, else it, it wouldn't work. Um, but it's so it's zoomed in so far, you can see the, the actual DNA. So we're going to select some tracks. To do that, you go to the select tracks that shows up in the um, upper left side. And this is a faceted track selector that allows you to see all the tracks and they're organized into categories. Um, and you also into organ systems and tissue ontology. So this allows you to filter for the kind of track that you want. So I want a variation track. I actually want to put the SNP track up first. So I click variation. There's just one track it's for SNP. Check that. Go back to the browser. And here, this, this happens to be the exact SNP that we're looking for. And the reason why I had saved that other file that has SNP IDs is because um, I was able to find out that this was the ID. So this is the ID. I wrote it down. So that's the ID that we're looking for, the one that overlapped those marks. The next thing I want to um, do is I want to get some the, all the gene predictions. So just click up here, it clicks all of them, go back. We can't see anything yet because we're zoomed in so far, but I'm going to select the tracks first. Now I want histone marks for adipose. So I click on the histone mark up here, and then I can say, um, do in this little box, I can just enter adipose and it will, you don't even have to type the whole, whole thing, it will, it will find. It does a text search and finds the tracks with that text. And I'm going to select all of them and go back. So, so that's all I'll select for now. Um, and so we're zoomed in very far. We're gonna. I want to zoom out, but I'm going to use this uh, 
this minus, the small minus zoom so that it goes out slowly because sometimes if you zoom too fast, you lose your place. So I'm gonna zoom, click the minus, zooming out, zooming out more. So eventually this SNP ID is going to disappear and that's why I'm trying to make sure that I'm careful and I don't accidentally move around to a different location. So this is, so now I think that SNP ID, yeah, might still be there, but there's, these are the marks that we overlap and there's another a different mark nearby and we're still zooming out. Now the SNP IDs are totally gone, but this is the place that we're, we care about right here. We can keep zooming. So we've actually zoomed enough that we can see the genes. So these are um, the genes that were nearby that we found in our region search were actually these two genes and they're, they're ensemble non-coding RNA genes. So they're long non-coding RNAs. So I'm actually gonna go ahead and um, close these other ones for now, just to make more space. So one thing I noticed when I zoomed out this far is I noticed that there is an H3K for ME3 mark. And so this, these marks indicate active um, transcription and they, they're usually found at, um, near the transcription start site. So I was wondering, because it seems like it's a little bit kind of off this transcription start site. Um, I was wondering possible if maybe we're missing a gene annotation in this area. So, so I decided to, to look at the RNA-seq to see if possible there's something that didn't get annotated. So if we go back to select tracks, we've already kind of uh, limited things to adipose. So, so now over here on our data types, we only have two of each kind of RNA-seq track. So the, all of the RNA-seq tracks are shown in um, several different visualizations, so depending on what you wanna do. What we wanna do first is to look at the string tie. String tie is um, a, a software that actually assembles read, RNA seq reads into, into model transcripts. So I'm selecting that for each one. There's two tissues of adipose. And we're gonna go back. And so when we do that, we actually find out that there are some transcripts here that string tie created, but they're not exactly represented up here. In fact, they're not even, even though they sort of overlap this one, they're not the same thing. If you, if you click on, um, any one of these, uh, anything that has exons, there'll be little red marks near the boundaries and any other things that have boundaries that match will, will show up red, but none of these match. So for example, if I click down here, I can see these exon boundaries and they all match each other. And so by, by doing this, I know that these exons are actually different than the ones showing up here in this long known coding RNA. So I also noticed that this, this mark is actually overlapping the transcription start site. So this, these transcripts are pointing to the left. So that means they're encoded on the minus strand. And so they start over here. Um, and so just to show one more piece of evidence from RNA-seq, we can actually look at the reads themselves. We'll look at read alignments. There's two versions and we'll look at the one called dense because that one's not as computationally intensive as the other one. So I can just click those. And oops, and go back. And there they are. So, so these reads, the reads will show up as blue and red, the actual read alignments themselves. And then these gray lines indicate junctions between reads that have that are spliced, which you know correspond to the introns. And so then we can, you know, just to see it a little bit further, you can zoom in. We'll just zoom into it to the exons and then see, see where the reads overlap. So um, I just wanted to show you this example as how you could, um, you're using a combination of FangMine and JBrowse to find things. And by having this extra um, RNA-seq data in JBrowse, so this, this kind of data is not in the database because it's not, these are not actual genes. And so by being able to look at this, you can, you can think, oh, maybe possibly this is actually a gene, and maybe maybe I found a gene that hasn't been annotated in the gene set yet. Okay, so um, so that's what I wanted to show you related to um, the FANG data, and um, I'm going to stop here and ask if anybody has questions about what I've shown so far. Just really quick.
you can you can either say it out loud or Deb check the chat. Yeah, there's nothing in the chat. Okay. In that case, I'm going to go on. Um, so so I'm going to show something that I've similar to what we showed in last year's tutorial, and it's how to do um, upload gene list to do gene ontology enrichment. Um, so this might actually go over the hour, but uh, anyway, so I understand if people need to, need to leave before it's done, but we will post one of these tutorials on YouTube in case you need to leave. So um, first, let me show you what data we'll be showing. So the data is from this paper. And our, our, one reason why this paper was selected is because they provided a supplemental data file that lists all the genes that were expressed in their experiment along with the genes that were significantly expressed or sig significantly differentially expressed. So by having all the genes that were expressed, it allows us to create a good background gene list for gene ontology enrichment. So uh, we're going to now go to our, back to list and we're going to upload. And this time we'll select gene. And this is for Bas Taurus. And we'll go to the spreadsheet. So this is the actual spreadsheet. And so it's just to show you, it shows, it shows all the genes that, are, that were expressed even if they weren't significant, which is really nice to have if you wanna um, be able to do reanalysis in the future. So we just enter that here, date list. And then we'll come up with a name. So I'm going to just, so this was the coldest, so we'll call it BG for background genes. Um, so notice that I, I lost, you know, almost 700 IDs. So there's a lot of genes that are missing. And that's because this, this paper was done, uh, the experiment was done with an older genome assembly. And so some of the, a lot of the genes have changed or are just not in the assembly anymore, but it's still, we still have a lot of genes. So we're gonna save those. So something that I want to emphasize is that when you do um, gene ontology enrichment, it's really important to make sure you're only working with one gene set at a time, either RefSeq or Ensemble, never mixed. And so the first thing you do is look at your gene source. So notice here that most of it, is ensemble genes, but there's a few RefSeq in here. So let's just select ensemble. We just want to keep those. So we're going to filter, and then restrict the table to the matching rows. And then we're going to resave it so that we can just save those for um, just ensemble genes. Okay, so now we're going to go back to upload and we're going to do the same thing with the differentially expressed genes. And so what I did is I had already pasted all the ones that were significant into this other sheet just so that I could copy paste quickly. But again, we lost some genes, but that's okay. We still have a lot. We'll save that list. And then we're gonna do the filtering again, get rid of the few RefSeq genes. Oops, click the wrong thing. There, cool. And then we'll save that. So I wanna show you that every single time you upload a gene list, you're going to get these um, gene ontology enrichment results, but you don't always wanna use them. So these this analysis was performed on our original gene list that still had RefSeq genes. And so this is not the correct analysis to do. In order to redo the analysis, you actually have to click on your gene list again. So if we go back to view and then click on it, it's gonna, it's going to cause it to redo the analysis and or recompute gene ontology with the correct list. And so now we'll just go down here. So there's important notes to avoid false positives. This is important that you read it every time and pay attention because if you don't, um, you'll get incorrect results. And the reason is that the background gene list used by um, by the intermine system is is all the genes for that species. 
but um, but we don't want to use all the genes as a background gene list. That would be too many genes. That would be over 20,000 because it's both RefSeq and Ensemble. So we just want to use the Ensemble background gene list for Ensemble genes. So you just reset your background population. And then, um, and then so you might, it's hard to tell here, but you might have lost some terms and then your p-values might would have changed, but these would be correct. Um, and then let's change it. You have to do each, um, you have to do each widget separately. And so notice here, even by changing to the correct background population, um, I don't actually have enrichment results. So if I would have shown the results I found before, those would have been incorrect. Um, so Ensemble does not have KEG pathway genes associated with them. That's because at KEG, they use only RefSeq IDs. So, uh, but we ha do have reactome pathways for Ensemble, so we can change the pathway data set. And again, we have to change our background population to get the correct result. And so notice we did lose a term. So that's important that you do that. So let's say that you really did want to use, um, do a keg analysis. So um, what you can do is use a template query to convert your ensemble IDs to RefSeq IDs. So you go to this alias and dbxref category and then select gene ID to database cross-reference. And then you select your list that you want to, to use. And so that's, we wanna do, we need to do both the background and the differentially expressed. So first we'll do the background. And we selected that list and then we're saying show results. And so here we show our, uh, the original gene IDs entered and then our, our back, our, I mean, our database cross-reference, which are the RefSeq IDs. And so we're going to save this list specifically of the cross-reference IDs, not the original genes, cross-references, click that. And then I can say, and then we'll redo that with the differentially expressed genes. And we'll save that as a list. So make sure you're doing cross reference. I often, when I do this, I make a mistake and I'll save the genes. And that doesn't help at all because it's the same ideas as before. So make sure it's cross reference. So let's see, you just go to list view, you can see them there. And then we'll just click on it. And it will, of course it does all the enrichments again. And if you wanted to do these, you'd have to remember to change your background to the correct thing, but we're gonna just look at keg right now. Um, so we'll change our background population to VG RefSeq. And